we are going to go over the vocabulary words in this chapter. So, starting with mill, can anyone look at the definitions and find the one that is in mill? I scrambled them, so they're not in order. Which one do you think it is? Can you read it? Yes, correct. So a mill is a factory for certain kinds of manufacture as a speaker, seal, or test Okay, so the next word is sharecropper. Lauren? A company that earns the money for people who care about the culture of their own farming creation. Yep, that is right. So a sharecropper is a common way of earning a living for people who could not afford to buy their own farm. So the next word is commend. Rachel? The start of beginning kind of has meaning. Yes, that's great. So commend means to start or begin. Next one is covering. Good for you. To keep lingering about, wait for a near at hand. Yes. So hovering is to keep lingering about. And does anyone know what a stroke is? Yeah. Olivia? A medical emergency. Strokes happen when blood flows to your brain stops within a minute's brain cells with the same path. Yes. Have any of you guys ever heard of someone who's had a stroke before? At your Yep. So, okay, so those are the vocabulary words.
of two more. Working on our old car. 
putting it in shape to go on the road, and Mama would wash and iron all of our clothes. Then everything would be packed in the tanned leather suitcase and the black cardboard suitcase, and we'd be ready to go. Mama and Daddy would sit in front with Betty on our Mama's lap, and Wilbur, Gerald, and I sat in the back with our legs on top of the suitcases. This was before cars had trunks, or radios, or conditioners, or heaters, and there were no super highways. The speed limit was 45 miles an hour, and we went 35 to keep from straining the car. It was an eight-hour trip to Norfolk, Virginia, where we always went first. Grandma Patty, Ridley Jones, and Grandpa had moved there by that time. I'd be spent about a week with them, but then I'd go on to Colonel for another week. On the road, I played peekaboo with Betty in between her mat naps. Or my brothers and I would count all the cars on the road. We'd say, there go one, that's 22, there go another one. And we'd read out loud the rhymes on red signs advertising Grandma shaving cream and wave at people sitting on their porches and argue with each other until one of us got real mad and real loud and Mama told us we were giving her the gym jam and to be quiet. One thing that we saw on the road frightened me, changing. We saw them often, the lines of black men in the black and white striped jail suits chained by their ankles and watched over as they repaired the road by white men with guns. I wasn't afraid of the men, and I didn't think about maybe being shot, but for a reason I didn't understand, I was afraid of the whole thing. Those bent over striped backs, the sharp points of the picks the men swung, the sound of the picks hitting the concrete, the sight of men with long guns facing, it scared me. After a few miles, that scared thing would fade away, and I'd start to have fun again, or I might take a nap, and it always seemed as if days had passed before we finally crossed the line into Carmel. By the time of my visit there, only a few trains were still passing through. My Carmel wasn't a train town or a mill town. It was a quiet town. Chinaberry trees and pump water and tree swings and figs and fat, pulpy grapes on the vine. People saying hey instead of hi, the way they did in Washington. Hey, hey, sending their voices up and down softly, singing it through their noses. Carmel was me running from the chickens when I was little riding around the yard in a goat cold cart, <coughs> sitting on the porch and letting people go, going by in their cars wait at them, reading on the rocking chair, taking long walks to the gas station for soda pop, with the children of mama and daddy, south and friends. Carmel was uncles and aunts and cousins, and granny and pop. They were daddy's parents, Mac and Will, Will and Man Little. Black people in Carmel called them Mr. Mac, and Miss Blumen. White people called them Uncle Mac and Maine Blumen. Granny was thin and red hair. She kept snuff tucked inside her bottom lip and wore aprons over her long dresses. I remember her most bending over the collars in her garden or feeding the chickens. She used to sew leftover material from my dresses into her patch for clothes. She used to make apple jelly and green tomato pickles. Anything her grandchildren wanted, she wanted them to have. And so did Pop. Leave the children alone, he used to tell his mama and daddy. They ain't doing nothing. Pop was a sharecropper. He worked in the field, farming the land that the white man owned it, and got paid in a share of the crops he raised. Along with that, he had almost always had some kind of little business going, even when daddy was a boy. A wheat market, an ice house, a cleaner, a grocery store. Long before I was born, Pa had been a member of the Marcus Garvey group that used to meet in Carmel on Sunday afternoons. It was one of thousands of branches of the United Negro Improvement Association, headed by Marcus Garvey. They met to talk about the beauty and strength of blackness and to plan the return of black people to Africa. I didn't think my grandfather was afraid of anything except the frogs that came on the mud-filled ditches at night and flopped across the yard and he'd be plenty of names to call them. The thumb on his right hand looked like a little bald man. The top joint had been cut off in a farm accident, and he had put it in a jar of preserving liquid that stayed on the front row mantel. I never got tired of looking at it. Children hung around Pa, nieces and nephews and neighbors, listening to his story, giggling at his joke. Some nights there would be just a Wilbur, Gerald, and me with my grandfather, sitting on the porch, but the only light was that of the stars and the nearest house was a long way down the road. He told scary stories and get really tickled when he got scared. He swore his ghost stories were true. 
One night, he said, me and my brother John was coming across the field over yonder. He made his arms tremble and point toward the woods across the highway. And we commenced to hear the strange sound. Um, 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 um. And we looked up and saw this, this paint. He twisted his face and narrowed his eyes in horror as he stared out into the darkness. And I could just feel all those paints hovering behind us, daring us to turn around and run for the door. Sometimes Paula stopped right in the middle of the story. Then what happened to Pop? One of us would ask. Oh, I left after that, he'd say, and he'd laugh. Then we laughed, small nervous laughs, wanting to believe that it had all been just a joke. Every year, when it was time for us to leave, a sudden change would come over Pop. One minute, he'd be challenging Daddy to a foot race that never took place, and the next minute, he was weak and sick, trying to get us to stay. He didn't think he would live to, to see us the following summer, he'd say. At breakfast, he'd begin to bless me, Lord. I sure do thank you for allowing me to see my family one last time before you call me home. And he'd pray a long, sad prayer that brought tears to our eyes. But finally, when nothing worked, Pa would give up and help Daddy load the car with suitcases and the sacks of fresh corn and peanuts. There'd be hugs and kisses and more tears, and then we'd drive away, leaving him and Granny standing on the side of the road, waving and waving and waving, getting smaller and smaller, until they blended into one and disappeared. Pa never liked to leave home. Granny came to visit us a few times over the years, but Pa always made an excuse. He couldn't get away right then. He had too much work to do or something. One year, though, he had to come. He had a stroke, and Mommy, Mama and Daddy brought him to Washington to take care of him. The stroke had damaged his body and his mind, said he didn't understand much of what was going on around him, but he knew he wasn't where he wanted to be. Mama would take him for a walk, and he'd ask people on the street, which way is Carmel? My grandfather never got back to Carmel. He lived in Washington for 18 months, and then in 1995, at the age of 78, he died. Kind of a sad story. Okay. So now, yes, Krista? One of the answers to the questions? Okay, we'll see. Okay, so did anyone fill out some of the stuff that they learned? Or at least have it in your head that you can say? Okay, so what have we learned? Krista? Let's try to think of a few more. Wilbur and Gerald. You guys can 
look back to the story to meet you. Um, who is Arnell? She is a girl. Did you learn that? Okay, I'm going to pass it down. And when you guys are done, you can hand them in the back. 